ironic that we're standing here, or sitting here today, <coughs> looking out the window with water running down the paddocks, um, and we're talking about drought, but such is the uh, life in Australia, um, and I guess it's just part of what we need to do. Um, so firstly, just um, <coughs> briefly, I've just been in, in Tamworth for um, approximately 25 years, uh, and uh, with Rava Bank the whole time, so I've lent money and seen a lot of different farms over that time, uh, all sorts of farms. Um, and as far as Rava Bank is concerned, um, so it's a, a bank that really only lends money to agriculture sector. So uh, it's in over 40 countries in the world and uh, in Australia it's one of the, the main lenders in Australian agriculture. Um, it's actually a cooperative, so we're not a listed company, so we don't have uh, distributions to shareholders. Um, so the, the profits that the bank makes are retained and then reinvest back in the business to provide more services to customers. So it's a it's slightly different nature, so we're fairly client orientated. Um, I think this point's been made well this morning by MLA that um, <coughs> beef prices have been increasing and demand is increasing. So in my mind, the prize is getting bigger, like the, the what we're all striving to do. We, we're going to, the potential is uh, with rising incomes in Asia and rising consumption of protein, um, in particular Asia, um, those people can afford to pay more for, for, for food uh, and as part of that choice they tend to eat more meat um, and the red meats are probably not traditionally their biggest consume, cons consumed meats but they will, they will eat more of that as they go along. So I think the, the good thing is in the, in the whole presentation of what's happening here this morning is that um, consumption is, is, is going to increase. It's just a matter of who can afford to pay for it. Um, and the other problem that we're facing, of course, is volatility. So volatility can come in lots of different shapes and forms. So it could be volatility of politics, which we're seeing. Uh, it could be volatility of currencies. It could be volatility um, of um, animal welfare. It could be but the big one, I think, in Australia that we all recognise is volatility of climate. So um, the driest continent in the world and, um, and probably the most extreme versions of what can happen uh, in, a, in the world. So that's just a, a graph of sea temperatures and surface temperatures of Australia. So uh, they are gradually increasing. So it's not just the rainfall we get, but it's the evaporation levels that we are uh, encountering as well So to produce grass. So. Um, so that, yeah, obviously the whole thing is, well, if we try to get the prize, what can we do to plan for managing volatility? And so that leads on to the drought discussion. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, the observations from a banker in terms of what people did well, um, both before, during and after the drought. Um, and some of the, I promise that we haven't collaborated any of the speakers because we didn't get to see each other's presentations, but we are talking about some of the same themes actually. So, um, and so both, not so much the physical characteristics, which I'll talk about, but, um, but mainly the financial characteristics, which we see from a banking perspective, um, but they're interlinked. So um, things that we saw that have worked well coming out of the drought is an ability um, for res resilient grasses, so subtropicals and native grasses. Um, although I have heard in uh, some parts of Australia, actually there's no seeds left of native grasses left. So they're having to reseed, or they may have to reseed or, or slowly be very patient for grasses to actually grow after rain because there's just actually no seeds left. So there's not only are there aren't any root systems left, but no seeds as well in the soil, or few, fewer seeds. Um, so having some of that in the mix, as well as your, your improved pastures, seems to have been a good mix. Um, obviously, farmers who have had grain and hay in storage prior to the drought uh, was a very big plus. So they had full hay sheds and perhaps silos. Um, I mean, there's obvious ones. We've talked about cow cycling, early weaning. Um, a big one, though, is mixed farms. From observation, mixed farmers have an ability to um, manage the drought better uh, and that's because they have access to uh, fail crops to, to stubble residue. Uh, often they've had some kind of harvest which they might have been able to retain for livestock. So and they've had machinery in place uh, to actually use some of those products. So also for replanting, you know, planting of fodder crops and replanting of pastures after drought. So 
from observation, farmers that did better coming out of the drought have been mixed farmers, uh, not, not solely, but it's, it's just made life a bit easier. Um, but if they're a mixed farm, they, they still have a, what, what uh, AgriPath might call as a pillar. A pillar. So they're, they're focused on one main objective in their business, and it could be beef production. Um, but whatever they do on that farm is revolving around making beef production profitable and successful. Um, so it could be that they're growing winter wheats, uh, and in a good year they'll harvest those winter wheats for grain, but in, a normal, in an average or, average or poor year they'll just graze them off completely. But, um, so I think mixed farms historically, you know, people 30 years ago said you must diversify, and in my time in banking I've only ever seen people get more focused actually, not, not more diversified. So focused on one industry or one product uh, and one market they might be aiming to focus on beef production for feedlot weight cattle. Um, but the other things that they do on the farm, even though they might be diversified, they're still focused to achieve that main goal. And that's often what the land is most naturally suited to. Um, so obviously you don't want to um, you want to, don't, want to get, don't want to go against nature. Um, another big production characteristic that I've seen, which people have managed the drought better, is containment feeding or feedlotting. So, again, um, just not having the energy used for animals walking long distances to water or feed. Um, the energy used by humans to actually cart feed miles across a farm. If it's all in one spot close to the... Close to the um, uh, the silo set up, well that's much better. Um, also the ground cover, like you know it was almost impossible to maintain ground cover during the drought um, for many people but if the uh, cattle didn't eat it the kangaroos did. Um, but if you, if you think about more normalised droughts or dry spells having ground cover is everything um, and we have definitely see it in cropping where people had stubble cover versus people that didn't. Um, that the following crop yields were considerably different. So, um, yeah, so ground cover's king if you can do it. And that does flow through to the financial performance of people's businesses. Um, so, financial characteristics of what people did well during the drought. Um, so, pre drought, these are some of the things that we observed. Uh, people had prepaid interest, so they'd had some better financial years. To minimise tax, they'd prepaid the next 12 months' worth of interest, um, which you can do. Uh, often you receive a discount, actually, for, for paying the funds early. Um, but that gives you an, an immediate break, then, that you don't have to pay interest in a drought year. You can, you can virtually go for 12 months without paying anything uh, in interest terms. So that's a really handy tool, uh, and it always places your business in a strong position. Farm management deposits, um, probably interestingly, farm management deposits aren't widely adopted, but they're adopted in big, big licks by a smaller number of producers. Um, and it hasn't quite achieved what the government wanted it to achieve because to just basically get back to having enough profit um, in better years to putting some aside for, for dry years um, or floods. Um, Definitely, people, few people had off-farm income or off-farm assets, so they could actually um, liquidate assets off-farm if they required, or supplement the farm business with off-farm income. Not every farmer has that, but that's certainly if some level of diversification off-farm in assets or income is very helpful. Uh, and the big one is borrowing capacity. That uh, most most borrowers, I guess, who we deal with, um, if you were highly leveraged to start with at the drought, it uh, made it harder to uh, quickly obtain funds, I suppose. So, um, so borrowing capacity means that you've got uh, you're not you're not too highly leveraged. Your loan to security ratio is reasonable, um, and yeah, that you're um, communicating well with your bank really to um, to keep in touch. So a bit more on that. Um, so during the drought, what farmers did well, um, they actually planned. Um, I took a view on the seasonal outlook, so everyone says, well, how can you predict the weather? Well, you can't, but you just listen to the experts for what it's worth, um, and you've got to make a decision or take a view, and that's what probably... People who didn't make any decisions were in all sorts of strife. So um, taking a view that it's, it's um, now in January and we haven't had any summer rain, so we're going to be... We usually go into a dry autumn, so we're going to be feeding for at least six months and perhaps we might get a May 
rainfall break. So taking a view on the season, doing having a strategy, um, either selling or, buy, or buying in feed. Often people sold some stock to buy health fund some feed. Um, but having a feed budget, and actually you know, we heard this morning about what that feed um, package included was quite important. Uh, and then cash flow budgeting that out. So, um, and, then, and then reviewing that strategy. So I think between two, two to three times a year, people would have to review their feed budgets and then therefore their cash flows and therefore their borrowing requirements. So we ended up, we often try to um, do a 12 month budget, but in some instances we could only, uh, we could only really review it for, for six months uh, and then we do another one and then assess it from there. So some people had two loan increases in one year, for example, uh, which is absolutely fine. Um, but the important thing there is that um, you're communicating those plans to your banker and you're commu communicating early because we actually saw that people who had a plan early were able to access cash quickly from their bank, more quickly, and actually were, because feed prices continue to rise over time, they actually bought their feed cheaper than, than their peers who were two or three or four months behind them. So, and they actually could get their hands on it as well. So some supplies of some feed just wasn't available. So really um, planning is critical. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, rebudgeting at critical dates and just keeping in touch with your bank. Um, yeah, people who did that well really had, I mean, a lot less stress. Uh, and, and also you probably observed some banks might have taken three or four months to actually respond with funding, like which was, yeah, you know, unacceptable in a way, but obviously their workloads were very big. Um, so if you got in early, you, you got your money quicker too. So, um, so that's sort of financially during the drought what people did well. And I think it was just that continual re review of their situation. Post drought, um, again, they took an educated view of the season um, and it's a bit of guesswork um, to some extent, but but we did see examples of people buy in stock towards the end of the drought, taking a punt uh, that it might rain and that they would make a large capital gain and on the on the stock, uh, but also they'd have the stock to eat the grass. Um, but if that didn't happen, what they did was a plan B and they usually referred back to a containment feeding paddock or the equipment to do that or a feedlot so that they could actually feed them. Well, they, when they bought them in, they were actually feeding them in containment paddocks. So, um, so that was a strategy which actually worked quite well. Um, but again, um, access to capital, like as soon as it rained, people took a view that, well, we might actually buy some cattle in for trading uh, and the trading margins have turned out to be excellent. Um, and that's because of the rising underlying market for cattle. But um, communicating again with your bank to having capital to buy in those cattle once the drought broke was very successful for people. So. Um, yeah, and having, just having that plan B if it didn't work. There's also a linkage between planning, uh, financial planning, if you want to call it that, budgeting and wellness. So definitely we saw people who hadn't planned really got quite stressed. Uh, people who had planned were making better decisions. Um, so, and they, they kept it together. So, you know, if, you, if your mind isn't right, well, you can't really perform right on the farm. So that every, every day, if you'd done a plan, Every day you got out of bed and you knew what you, what you were going to do. You weren't saying, oh shit, what am I going to do today? Like, what, how am I going to feed these animals? So forward planning, um, they were honest with themselves. They weren't trying to say, oh, I think we can get away with feeding the cattle X number of kilos a day when actually they needed, you know, they needed 10, not five. Um, so, you know, actually being, not trying to skimp on things. And there definitely was a correlation between um, body scores uh, and outcomes as well. I, I would say that from observation, I, not from not from the research, but that's. Um, so the other thing was um, there was a quite a lot of well, uh, well, uh, empathy I think from the public towards farmers during the drought, which um, was really good. Like there was good press coverage, um, and I think that actually helped support people mentally. Like even though the people in the city may not have um, experienced the. Uh, the, the, the hungry cattle, but they also experienced dust storms. But I think that was really a, quite a connection, a, a growing connection, maybe more so than other droughts that, that I've seen um, between city and country. And I think that's actually one of the great challenges of, a, of Australia is our geography, is that 90% of the population live in urban areas a long way removed from any kind of farmland. Um, 
you know, Europe is very much integrated, city and country is very much integrated in the same location, uh, whereas Australia we're quite removed. Um, so it's really quite important um, that we have the, 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 the empathy of the general public on board, because that actually leads on to government being able to provide support uh, in, in, a, um, in a drought or a, a uh, national emergency, I guess. So, um, so it sort of leads on to my, another little point of mine, I guess, is the role of farmers. I think every farmer is really an ambassador for agriculture. So, you know, it's not, we're not, we shouldn't be leaving it up to MLA to do the good work. Um, and I think I wrote down here, um, the role of every farmer is really to be a safe food producer who cares about animal wel welfare and sustainability. Like, if you can do those things um, and be happy, like for, you know, I'm not saying we invite the cameras onto your farm, but you should be able to think, well, if, a, if someone from the city came out now, would they think I'm a good person or a bad person? Am I doing a good job or a bad job? Because um, it only takes one really bad scenario uh, and it gets publicised on social media and, you know, the whole, <coughs> Uh, the whole aim of um, what you're trying to do. I mean, the first first role of the, of our farmers, I think, is really looking after the family and looking after the land and making a profit, hopefully, because that's part of sustainability. Um, but the second role is um, being ambassadors for the for agriculture, and that's quite important. And corporates are expecting that now. So, so in Europe, there's a thing called green bonds. So, if you can demonstrate that you are uh, so it's a, it's a form of capital that banks can borrow. So, so it's investors who are, are mindful of sustainability are putting money into green, green deposits, if you like, uh, and that can only be set lent to uh, industries or farmers or borrowers who are, have green credentials. So I'm not saying that's, that's dominating the market, but it's a growing form of capital. So, um, and you know, I just heard on the radio this morning that um, they uh, some organisation has done a review of corporations meeting their target of carbon neutrality, neutrality by 2050 and investors aren't happy. So Australia's got 12 large companies on that list um, who aren't apparently doing enough. So, um, so I think everyone would like to see, both people in the town and country, would like to see the right-hand picture, not the left-hand picture. Um, and um, I mean, we can't control everything, but we would just do our best. Yep, so I think um, it's, a, it's a gradually changing landscape, but <clears throat> depositors of banks uh, and shareholders of banks are wanting to know that the banks are lending to people that are acting responsibly. Um, so over time, you know, that's not in, it's not necessarily cutting people off from money at all, but it's just, um, so over time the banks will probably want to work with farmers to make sure that the minimum things are being done. And I think 90% of, 90, 95 or 98% of all farms are doing the right thing. So, um, you know, there's chemical, there's already chemical accreditation, there's, um, you know, animal welfare declarations. You know, we're, we're doing all those things, but it's just anything, and, and um, yes, yeah, so I suppose there's going to be growing pressure from outside influences that affect that. And so banks have to be seen, not only be lending socially responsibly in terms of not lending people into, not lending money to people who might get into financial difficulty. That's one thing, but the other thing is, it, um, yeah, environmentally doing the right thing as well. So, um, yeah, so there is a there is a, a growing influence of that over time.